I right here having some technical difficulty, but I got a great technical staff here. Uh, good evening and welcome to Bright Lights, a weekly podcast where we bring to you uh, achievers in various fields of human endeavor for them to share their stories, uh, give you encouragement, talk about the obstacles they had to overcome because look, uh, very few things that we can achieve in life without overcoming ob obstacles and work and hard work and just tenacity. And they're going to bring that to you to help encourage you because, look, I'll ba my basic message is uh, you can be whatever you want to be. And we're here to show you how, especially in America, regardless of all the criticism that has become uh, in vogue to uh, say nowadays, uh, all I know is that um, I was this little a kid from Mississippi and I had these dreams and uh, nowhere at any time uh, did I feel like I could not achieve my goals and my dreams and nowhere at any time uh, did I feel like people were uh, insurmountable obstacles. So uh, we're here to share that with you. Now, a couple of quick things as you know, I normally do a look back over my week. Uh, let's start with the crazy stuff. Uh, this insane asylum uh, we know as City Hall, that's downtown, uh, is still cranking out craziness. Uh, they want us to believe that they've retreated on this whole defund the police issue, but they they have not. Uh, they've come up with some type of crazy charter language to try to uh, fool you and get you confused and have you support uh, this nonsense idea of defunding the police. Uh, I just remember, uh, I think it was in the 11th grade, I read Animal Farm by George Orwell. And I just love that. That's one of my favorite books, and he's one of my favorite writers. And it's about, it's kind of like a parody, uh, whatever, on communism and when the animals actually took over from the humans. And the thing I remember the most is that they had 10 commandments for animals. And the first one was, uh, all animals are created equal except some are more equal than others. And that gets into me what I was talking about with George Orwell. He put out an essay called Politics in the English Language, where he talks about how politician uses a language that's designed to make lies sound like truth and murder respectable and give the appearance of solidity to pure win, I think, as he called it. And that's basically what they're doing with this, trying with the defund the police uh, I, uh, issue that they're trying to push across on us, changing names and uh, calling it imagining new, reimagining policemen and all that kind of craziness. But they're still down there in charge uh, from the mayor to the city council. Uh, they're still the insane in charge of the asylum. And I always have to make uh, some uh, exception for. Lisa Goodman, because I do hear that she's probably one of the main, uh, one of the few, if any, uh, sane ones left. So that we talk about that. Watch out for that. Don't let them fool you. We do not want to defund the police, folks. Uh, secondly, hey, I always have to bring up my little grandson. Uh, spent a couple of days with him. Uh, we went to a softball tournament that my niece, Anaya, is in. Had a great time there. He had a chance to hang out with kids, play soccer and all that good stuff. And then yesterday evening, it was such a wonderful day. We went to the park for a few hours, had a chance to play with some of the neighbor's kids. And there's a bed and breakfast uh, in my little nice little community there. And we had some folks from Sweden there and their children. So he had a chance to play with them. And so that's all good. Now, let's get on to our guest this evening, uh, Frank. Tochia, uh, we'll talk to Frank. By the time we're done here, uh, Frank and I explain to our whole audience how each and every one of you can be movie stars and TV stars and things like that. That's why I have Frank on here today. So, uh, hey, Frank, uh, welcome to Bright Lights. Hey, Lacey, how are you? <laughs> I, I put a little pressure on you there, Frank. Yeah, just a little bit, just a little bit, yeah, yeah. just a little bit. You, you got to create some Halle Berry's and, and Morgan <laughs> Freeman's out of this <laughs> situation. Spike Lee's and everything else, you know, and what is it, Sarantino's and Tarantino's or whatever the name is. So, anyway, welcome. Uh, how are you doing this evening, Frank? I'm doing really good. It's a beautiful day out here in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. It wasn't quite 100, so it was nice out and so uh, excited to... The chat with my old friend Lacey Johnson and uh, 
and uh, have a, have some pretty good banter back and forth. So I'm excited for this conversation. I, I am too. And uh, I was telling Frank, we have a little pre talk before I, we go on the air is that the first time I met him, talked to him, I was tell he was a good guy and he hasn't let me down on that yet. And I really appreciate it. So Frank, uh, right now you're out in the Phoenix area. Is it Tempe? Is that where you at? Scottsdale. Scottsdale. Okay. Okay. But I do know that uh, you're originally from Long Island, New York. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your family and what was it in your background that predicted that you would grow up to be a uh, TV and, and movie producer as you are now? Well, I don't know if that was actually in the cards back in the day. I was, uh, you're right, I grew up on Long Island, a little town called Rockville Center, Long Island. And uh, Long Island is broken up into two counties, if you think of counties. It's uh, Nassau County, which is closer to the city, and Suffolk County, which is closer, which is like the Hamptons or Montauk, all the way out further out east. And uh, with, you know, you, we were just talking a few minutes ago, Rockville Center, actually, uh, with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up, we, we put together a little documentary. Uh, Rockville Center actually lost the most amount of people on 9-11 that day, almost 100 people. And so uh, this was a, it's a very unique town, very close in the town, still very is, still is uh, unbelievably close. And everywhere, you know, I call it my own little Mayberry, where everybody knows everybody. And uh, you could, we walked to school, we walked to the pizza place, we walked on our dates, we walked to the movie theaters, um, and everybody knew everyone. So you, you know, you couldn't do anything without it getting back to your parents. And, and that old adage where it takes a village to raise a child, well, the, the town is actually a village. It's the village of Rockville Center. So I joke, it took the village of Rockville Center to raise me. I was a little bit more rambunctious than most folks. And uh, and so I was a college, uh, I was a football and baseball player and wrestler, and uh, we ended up, uh, I ended up getting a football scholarship and played football at uh, Towson University in Maryland. And uh, so I graduated with no debt, didn't graduate, my parents didn't have to spend thousands of dollars, and, uh, which was uh, very helpful and a great time in my life. And, uh, and so that was uh, kind of led me into a, a career down the road. But after college, I went to go work on Wall Street and I uh, was an estate planner for high net worth folks, and there, I was there in the 1993 during the first World Trade Center bombing. Uh, my office was literally across the street, and uh, they shut down the city. The hotels booked up fast, and we ended up sleeping on the floor in, the, in our office because uh, you couldn't get in and out. They closed the tunnels. They closed the, uh, the, the bridges, and so we were, we were just kind of stuck there for 24 hours until they cleared everything up. And so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I love New York. I mean, uh, the food, the people, the vibe, it's just, you know, you got the beaches, you got this, the center of everything and kind of some crazy stuff going on now there, which it is, is kind of yeah. not the same, uh, but hopefully it'll get better soon. Well, I was sharing with you and I often share with people, uh, my wife and I, we've traveled a lot uh, in the States, uh, continental United States, Hawaii, islands, Europe, and believe it or not, the most friendly people we met are New Yorkers. And uh, we're pretty good people. I, 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 yeah, I know. I know. People especially the Italian New Yorkers. <laughs> yes, especially the Italian New Yorkers. Except I didn't check their heritage for right guys. <laughs> 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 and so people find that strange. And then you also mentioned about the, your childhood and growing up in the village. And uh when I see my little grandson playing and he doesn't have that many friends all the time look we we grew i grew up in the village also and the crazy thing about it and you hit on all the adults they hung together and they thought alike and and if you got in trouble with one you were in trouble with all of them yep. and but the, the thing i remember the most we get i get up in the morning and i'd make up my bed and eat breakfast and we were outside all day every day with little kids our own age yeah. and it was just such great time and uh, in fact, uh, our parents had a rule, especially for boys, you can't be in the house in the middle of the day. So uh, I really appreciate <laughs> that. OK, so uh, you went to Wall Street. Uh, well, first of all, I have to guess at what position you you, you remind me of a, a linebacker kind of a guy. But what position yeah, outside linebacker? Yeah, I knew that. I got a my youngest son played defensive line linebacker, so you kind of got the same type of uh, uh, of strut and vibe, uh, Frank. Uh, so you on Wall Street, uh, uh, managing high net worth individuals' money, and then somewhere along the line, uh, Frank, you decided to leave, 
and I don't know whether you left New York at that time, but and then you, uh, what, what happened after you left the investment? Yeah, so, so before my career in Wall Street, I was vice president for Jacqueline Fitness Centers back in okay. the day. Oh, okay, okay. And uh -huh. I met my wife, my future wife there. She was a senior vice president, and, you know, they kind of frowned on nepotism. So I left and went to go work on Wall Street. And, uh -huh. um, and years later, a few years later, my wife got transferred from New York to Phoenix, Arizona. And I didn't know any, you know, this is, you know, back in the 90s, I didn't know anything about Phoenix. I mean, tumbleweeds and maybe some distant relatives in witness protection, but that's about it on, uh, <laughs> on Phoenix. I knew nobody. There was no Wall Street here. And me being the dutiful husband, we were expecting our first child. And, and I said, okay, let's do it. And, and, uh, and here, and I'm, you know, almost 20, you know, over 28 years later, I'm still here. And, and so, yeah, that's how I got to here. And, and um, so obviously no Wall Street. So I started uh, a business called College Prospects where we started, where we helped high school athletes get athletic scholarships. So that was my first endeavor uh, in, uh, as an entrepreneur and, uh, and working on that. And, uh, and so we did that. That was kind of a neat opportunity where we helped high school kids get athletic scholarships. It was so cool. I was still involved here and there. I love going to high school sports, much better than pro sports with all yep, the junk yep. that was going on. I agree. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've had a few players over the years that made it into the NFL. Our mutual friend, Jack Brewer, that's how we met him back when he was a teenager. And he was an NFL great. And now he's doing amazing things and helping people with his charities in Haiti and prison reform. And so he's doing really good. Proud to call him a good friend. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I got divorced a few years back. And, uh, and so I have a cousin who's in California, producer, former Mr. America bodybuilder, a guy named Mike Torchia. And I uh, went out to visit him and got introduced to some people. And I said, in the entertainment business. And, and we raised some money for a small film. And I'm like, well, that was easy. And uh, so I started Torch Entertainment. And and we got involved with films and TV shows, and, and that was the start of the new career. Well, I, first of all, I love the name of your company, Torch Entertainment. But before we uh, leave your whole situation in Arizona, uh, I do know that you have a grandson. You have two daughters, is it, Frank? Tell us about your current uh, uh, children's situation here. Yeah, so uh, I, after my divorce, I had two daughters. Uh, and I raised my daughters by myself for 10 years. So uh, it was me and my kids. And, um, you know, super close. My dad lived with us before he passed away. And, and so my younger daughter, so a little bit of history. You know, my da younger daughter went through addiction about 10 years ago. And Teen Challenge, a national faith-based organization, saved my daughter's life. So when I tell people I lead a blessed life, I do because my daughter's still here. Because I should have lost my daughter so long ago. And uh, especially with what happened on last year, still going on this year, people feel helpless, hopeless, and alone. And those emotions could, you know, should have killed my daughter. And I was very fortunate that Teen Challenge ended up saving her life. And today, my daughter Amber is a beautiful young woman at uh, 25 years old, soon to be 26 next month. And she's got two beautiful daughters. So I got two granddaughters, three years old, and, and uh, next month will be one years old. So three and one year old granddaughters. Uh, that uh, so I got four four women in my life, my two daughters and two granddaughters at the present time. So Frank, uh, you mentioned your daughter's addiction and teen challenge. What did you learn as a parent relative to uh, teen addiction, and what lesson did you? Uh, why does it happen? And and I know you can't you can't uh, come up with a broad answer that cover most cases, but. Just generally speaking, what lesson did you learn from that situation? That I couldn't control it. I mean, I, I went through the comedy of errors that I think in being a strong Italian New Yorker and, and I grounded her. Uh, she went out the window. I nailed the window shut. You know, I put an alarm system in. She did a MacGyver and put like uh, aluminum foil and was able to jimmy rig the the, the alarm system and went out the back door of the alarm without the alarm going off. And, and so I was, I was, it's not something that you can control, uh, but you do got to get your kid help. And, right, um, right. and I, and that's what I learned and you do it sooner rather than later. And the other, the last part is, you know, uh, you know, you say you, you know, you and I are really good friends. And back in the day, 10 years ago, I never shared with anyone that my daughter's going through addiction. 
Right. Because I felt guilty, because I was embarrassed, it's my fault, it's a reflection on me, mm-hmm. and I was ashamed. Uh, all things that could have not had my daughter here. Right. And so if anyone is going through that, and if, as a parent, don't feel guilty, don't feel embarrassed, don't feel ashamed, just go get your daughter some help or your son some help. Because that's the only thing that's going to, that's the only thing that matters in life. Right. And, um, and so that's, that's something that I encourage everyone. Now my daughter and I scream it from the rooftops. We did a TV show a few years ago, In Crisis, Getting Through the Storms of Life. And my daughter and I were in a segment. And, uh, you know, it's the wrong crowd, wrong decisions. And it's just, it leads from one thing to another. It, uh, I believe it starts with marijuana because it's what started it. And then it starts with the, with the prescription drugs, the Percocets. And uh, they don't take them like pills. Oh, my back hurts. I'm just going to take a couple of pills. No, they smoke them. They crumble them up. They put them in a thing and they smoke it. And they call it smoking a Percocet. But the dealers charge them $75 a piece. And so when they can't afford that, and they said, oh, I can't afford it. I have no money. And they give them a little bag of heroin. Oh, no, I don't do needles. Oh, just smoke it like Percocet. And once you do the first one, it's you're done. Well, it sounds like you did a great job uh, as a father. Was there any time that you came close to giving up, or was there a time when you just uh, was almost too much to bear? And because that can be a very challenging situation for anybody to deal with. Well, the, the hardest part was dropping her off. And years later, my daughter and I talked about it. We didn't talk about it while it was going on or whatnot. But for the first 30 days, you know, um, you got to drop her off and then you say goodbye. And she's telling and it was hard for her because she felt like I was abandoning her. And I felt like I was abandoning her. And that was the of all the thing that that first moment when you drop her off and you got to, you know, you leave her there and you go, you drive off. That was the hardest part. Uh, and because I, I felt helpless at that moment. I'm, you know, I'm counting on Teen Challenge, this all girls and they, uh, this faith based organization, they were, they don't put kids on drugs to get them off drugs, which is the thing that sold me on this organization. There's, there's other rehab centers, they'll put them on method, methadone or minoxicil or whatever it's called, sinoxicil, uh, and they put kids on drugs to get them off drugs, which I wasn't going to do to my kid. Right, and right. Uh, th- but that was the hardest part. So uh, and it was hard coming home when she wasn't there. And so uh, and then for 30 days, there's no communication. Right. And right, so while right. she was there, I wrote her a love letter every day. Oh, you wow. can do this. I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. God's not done with you yet. And we're actually going to do a movie about it called Love Letters to Amber, which is my daughter's name. And I'm quite sure you're going to let me know when this, that movie hits Netflix or whatever. The Absolutely. Or whatever. Uh, well, here's the thing, uh, and like I say, I'm really uh, very, very proud of the way you handle that, not that you need my pride or anything like that. Uh, so somewhere down the line, and, and let's get into your TV and movie production, you indicated that you had a cousin who was a bodybuilder, I think, who invited you to Hollywood, L.A., and you came up with this first project. Uh, what was your first uh, production project? Uh-huh. It was, we were just, the, we were, the, we were the money behind it. This was back in okay, 2007 okay. Uh-huh. before the uh-huh. crash where you can just sneeze and money would fall. From right, the right, sky. right. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even uh, have to verify income or anything. Yeah, like you know, it was nothing. You, as long as you got a breath <laughs> on your body, right, you can right. you get money. Yeah, yeah. And it was a little movie called Deserted. And I had never seen a movie. I mean, when you watch something and you see the actor or actress walking towards the camera, I mean, in your head, you know, there's a camera there, but you don't know there's a camera there. And then kind of seeing all how that puts together, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And it was the first time that I saw anything put together. And I'm like, okay, this is how I can think I can do this. And and we started creating our own projects and our own films. And, uh, you know, we've had, you know, something like 13 TV shows and three feature films, three documentaries. And we've done a lot of commercials for different people, both political candidates and for businesses. And and uh, one of the more, more successful movies we did was a movie called Wish Man. And Wish Man was about the Make-A-Wish Foundation founder, Frank Shankowitz. And he started the Make-A-Wish Foundation up in Prescott, Arizona, 40 years ago. And he was a motorcycle cop, and he was kind of ornery, but he had a terrible upbringing. And so the story is his life and how anyone can be a hero, because he was the most 
least likely guy to be a hero. You know, he was, you know, he drank and he was just, he was just, cause he had a rough life. His mom abandoned him on an Indian reservation. His mom told him his dad died, his dad didn't die. And, and, uh, and Chips, the TV show Chips with Eric Estrada and Larry Wilcox was really popular back in the day. And <clears throat> a little boy was dying of leukemia and his dream was to become a motorcycle cop. And they asked Frank and Frank said, nah, rah, 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 cause he was an ornery guy. And they finally persuaded him and he got him a little uniform and a little electric motorcycle. Mm-hmm. And they fulfilled this little boy's dream. And unfortunately, three days later, the little boy died. And they had a funeral in Chicago. And there was a, a newspaper article on like the Chicago Tribune. Frank Shankowitz Jr. helps this little boy who was dying of leukemia. Well, his dad, Frank Shankowitz Sr., has been trying to find him for 30 years. They couldn't, he couldn't find him. He goes, he reads an article. Oh, my God, I found my son. He was able to reconnect with his dad. Wow. And uh, he went back up to Prescott, Arizona, and he was so touched, he started the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And uh, so the story is of, of his life and how, like I said, anyone can be a hero. And, uh, and so those are the kind of projects we try to get involved with. We don't do any of the drama like the Kardashians or anything like that. We, right. we try to do feel-good stories and, and try to do fun. We've done cooking shows. We've done car shows. I'm a car guy. I love cars and sounds and fast and, and all that cool stuff. And uh, we've done some other things over the year, like the, boot, the TV show In Crisis, Getting Through the Storms of Life. And uh, we've done some baseball documentaries. I love baseball. My dad played for the Yankees, so it's, uh, baseball is ingrained in me. You kind of see in uh, the background the New York Yankee uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, poster that that. on the back. Uh, so we try to do feel-good stories, and we got we got some new stuff coming up uh, that we're getting and we're pretty excited about doing. And uh, So, yeah, th- those are the kind of things that we try to be inspiring. The, the idea is to inspire others instead of trying to put people down. There's enough people putting people down and, you know, you're not worthwhile or you can't do this. Don't tell me what you can't do. Let's inspire someone to do something. And that's right. kind of our mantra. Right. I'm a baseball fan also, and I, I'm quite familiar with the Yankees, uh, the early 60s, mid 60s with Pepitone. And, yeah, my dad um, came Trash. up with Joe Pepitone. Oh, really? Tom Trash, Trash, and I think his name was, and Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. So I'm pretty familiar yep. with that. Just out of curiosity, uh, not only do I see the New York Yankees logo, but I see a picture of a gentleman swinging a bat back there. All almost remind me of Ted Williams, but I'm quite sure it's not. Who is that in the picture? That's Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, big Lou Gehrig. Yeah, but born, yeah. there's nothing Boston in my house. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I thought I figured that one. Uh, so now. Uh, What's the latest uh, TV show uh, that you produced and where may I find it or the audience may find it, uh, Frank? Well, we, we, ju- we actually just finished a pilot for HGTV, so it'll be out in 2022, called Selling Paradise in Paradise Valley, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's uh, these twin girls, uh, Shelly and Betsy, uh, they're from New Jersey, identical twins and they sell real estate. They sell high end real estate and they got a cool little vibe about them and that East coast vibe and, and they hustle and they got a great personality and they, they bust their butt for their clients and they have a lot of fun when they do it as well. And, and so that's, uh, that's one of the newer projects. We have a couple others uh, that uh, one uh, it'll be on direct TV next year. Uh, It's called rock and roll rarities. It's a kind of like a rock and roll memorabilia show. Mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, with Matt Pinfield from the old MTV days, and okay. um, and so yeah, then uh, we we have a, ha- a handful that we're getting ready to to start filming again, and uh, and we just uh, we got a couple of paranormal shows that'll be out on streaming soon as well called Haunted Tours, and another one Share Your Scare uh, uh, that was done by a group. Uh, good friends of ours down in Florida, the Jalbert brothers, Brian and Jake, and we partnered with them to bring those two shows uh, to fruition. And um, yeah, we have uh, we have a lot of cool stuff. We have a cooking show uh, called Family Kitchen Revival with Chef Jonathan Sinto. Uh, he was on Chopped and uh, was from New York, Italian guy. So uh, really cool guy. And it's about get, getting in the it kind of goes with our theme of helping others. And so Family Kitchen Revival is where someone's going through some tragedy or struggles. He goes in and kind of 
makes this amazing meal and helps them make this amazing meal and kind of maybe takes their mind off of some of the things that they've been going through, whether it was cancer or addiction or, or someone passed away or what someone went to jail. And so he goes in there and, and does something cool to kind of inspire people. And being, inspir- being an inspiration is kind of the theme that we try to get through in everything that we do. Okay. Uh, Frank, you make it almost seem too easy to <laughs> get into television production and produce movies. Oh, I had a friend of mine who was in it, and he said, come on, why don't you do this? And yeah, we went out and got the money, and bam, I'm a TV producer, I'm a movie producer. There got to be more to it than that, Frank. So why don't you tell us, uh, give us an idea how lucky you had to be, how hard you had to work to get lucky. And yeah, I don't believe in luck. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, how do you work? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You know, you know, you know. I, I, I was raised by uh, a mom who was a hairdresser, owned her own hair salon. My dad was a teamster. He owned the luncheonette. He owned limo companies. He was a, the hustlest hustle with an eighth grade education. Probably the smartest man I ever knew. And uh, that's kind of instilled the work ethic. You know, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning. I go to bed at twelve o'clock every night. Uh, you know, I don't need much sleep, you know, uh, uh, there's plenty of time to sleep when you die. So I try to get, I try to make the most of my life, but like in anything else, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really the passion you have that it's not tedious and that's whatever you're going to do. I don't care what it is. I tell my kids, uh, you know, all the time, I said, find something that you love to do and be your own boss. Uh, you know, cause the old adage, if they hire you, they could fire you. And, right, uh, right. and so I've been an entrepreneur my whole life and, uh, and I love that. I love what the weight of the world on my shoulders. I don't have to worry about, you know, who, uh, trying to negotiate a pay or, you know, when's my, when's my break, how many days vacation of personal time. I work as hard as I want. And if I want to make more money, I work my butt off, but in the film and TV business, it's, it's never what you know, it's always who you know. And I've built a lot of good relationships and it's hard. You got to build those relationships. And, and in the beginning, you really don't have that credibility. So the people I partnered with, I used their credibility and say, hey, here's who I'm working with. They, they believe in me and what we're doing. That's why they partnered with us. And so that's how I built my reputation by others believing in what I'm doing. And then eventually I got to the point where people see that I've been successful. And it's, it's hard. You can... There's a lot of people that don't have never had a TV show and never had a movie and never done anything in this business. And it's hard. You know, you got to, you know, if, when you have a movie, you got to raise the money. <clears throat> and on the, mm-hmm. on the Wishman movie, we talked about this a, a little bit ago. <clears throat> so it was filming up in Prescott, Arizona, and I'm an Arizona based filmmaker. And my friends were orig- one of the original producers on it. And uh, they came to me and said, hey, I'll help. Just give my daughter Amber a job as a makeup artist because my daughter's now a makeup artist. And they said, absolutely. So they were paying her. Everything's fine. I'm helping out with my team and sending them up and we're doing a lot of work. And they had a call from my daughter. We haven't been paid. I'm like, Hey, what do you mean? And, uh, and so we talked about, we had a meeting with them to say, Hey, what's going on? And one of their investors fell out. Uh, I was right during Harvard, uh, you know, 2017 uh, hurricane Harvey. And, uh, and they, they needed the money. And so uh, I, from a, I found out on a Friday and the following Friday, we were able to raise the money and, and save the film and it got made. And uh, that happens more times than you think. I mean, you know, uh, trying to, you know, you got to need, you need the money to do something and uh, you need to pay the crew, you need to pay the talent and, 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 and everybody. Uh, then the hard part comes in, you got to get distribution. So you have the film made, you have the TV show made, uh, you got to have other people see it. So you got to get distribution. A film is going to be on Netflix or in the theaters or something like that. Or are you going to be in, um, hold on. Uh, or are you going to be in uh, uh, Amazon or one of those platforms? So the idea is to get distribution. TV shows, you got to be on one of the networks. You got to be on cable or one of the streamers as well. And they, they're all getting pitched a lot of stuff. So why are they going to pick your show? And so right. we try to have enough information to persuade them that, hey, this is a show. It meets their demographics. We use data. Uh, obviously, we want to shoot it all really well, make sure that our, you know, our, our content is really produced really well. And the content's also fun, cool, and unique. 
And then we do, you know, price plays a, a part in it all as well. You know, making sure that, you know, hey, we're price competitive. We're not, we're not the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. We're a reasonably priced show. So it's not going to cost a fortune to pick up our show. And, uh, and I joke, I say, you know, it's, uh, in this business, you hear more no's than yeses, kind of like my dating mm -hmm. life right now. <laughs> so uh, have you ever had a show that you produced? And let's throw in another uh, factor. And you were really proud of and you love, but you could not get it distributed? Yeah, yeah there's a couple of them. And um, it, it's a lot of it is... Just, you know, for whatever reason, you just think, it. hey, this is the great show. Uh, but I don't take uh, – it may be – they may say, no, I'm just hearing not yet. All right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. so I just have to give them more information to get them to the point where they can where they can say yes to me. And so I never take no. I'm always – you know, I'm polite. I'm, I tell everyone I'm patiently persistent. So uh, I, I think that's a, uh, it's a good trait to have. And I tell, I try to encourage people to be that, you know, you got to be patient in business, but you got to be somewhat persistent to let, but not overbearing to let them know that, you know, Hey, don't forget about me. You know, uh, let's, right, right. Uh, you don't want to be too overwhelming where they stop taking your calls. Uh, but everyone still takes my calls. And, it, you know, even though not everyone says yes to me, they like the product, they like the, the, the shows, uh, you know, so not everyone in the network says yes, but I'm uh, patiently persistent enough to say, hey, you know, maybe now. So maybe two years ago, there was a show that maybe didn't fit their format. And mm -hmm. now it does. And so that's something that we do. So based upon my limited knowledge of the various roles in TV shows and movies, when I think of the money guy, I think of an executive producer. When I think of the guy who's in charge, other lady, I should say, uh, don't don't be sending me any direct messages and <laughs> posts out there, folks. You know how people are nowadays. Uh, when I think of uh, the production aspect of it, where we're bringing all the creative things together, that's why I think of a producer. Are you kind of like a combination of those two, or one or the other, or or do I have it right? I could just have everything. Well, right it, you're it, you're right for for film. Film the executive producers mm -hmm. raise the money. And then right. the producers are the, the on-set people that kind of make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a writer who wrote the script. You got a director who's going to kind of put the, the paint the picture, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then the producer kind of coordinates on set. But the executive producers on film are the money guys. Those are the, uh, the folks who are going to write the checks. Right. TV is a little bit different. The executive producers are the creators of the show. Right. Okay. So a TV show works differently than a film because it's the executive producers created the show. Like, you know, we did a show called, uh, you know, in love with food. Uh, you know, where uh, we work, we partnered with this gal, uh, Wendy Lane. And her idea is to bring to bring back romance and intimacy in relationships through cooking in the kitchen. So uh, she was this social media person. And we came up with the show idea that in love with food, helping couples, reignite the romance that they had way back when. And so as the creators and executive producers of the show, and then you have a director who's going to direct it. And then an onset producer is going to help coordinate everything. Oh, you got, I got to follow up with you and get a, where I can find that show. And I've been trying to sell that to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> About cooking and love and romance. And she hasn't yeah, bought it yet, it's, Frank. You know, it's, you, you might help me out on that particular issue with my wife here in my negotiation. You know, you have to negotiate. Yeah, well, it's all right about there. doing something together, you know, because right. we're, okay. we're, oh, okay. we're, yeah. we're, uh -huh. we're so busy. So if you can shop together and you don't have to do it every day because right, life right, gets complicated. Right. But if, if you can go shopping together or have some kind of food delivery, but you're in the kitchen and you're preparing it together and then you eat it together and have a glass of wine or, or whatnot, it, it makes for a nice intimate romance to kind of rekindle it because you know we all get so busy in a rut and you order to take out and everyone's eating in their own time frame and, and life happens and next thing you know you're you know you're 25 years in or 10 years in or 15 years in and you lost the spark because you just whatever happens so this is a show to help bring people back together okay so to be a producer and like you said earlier uh you have to know it's who you know you got to know people 
And, you know, as I go through life, I'm beginning to understand that if you went to an Ivy League school, it's not so much about what you know when you come out. It's about your network. You got a network there that you can pick up the phone and call just about anybody. And so I'm really beginning to appreciate that network. Uh, but uh, uh, to be a producer, you had to have your own little network. And, and I'm going to talk to you about different roles in a show and a, uh, and movies and put you on the spot a little bit, Frank, I think. But, you know, you can handle it. Uh, and if people wanted to maybe have a career in these particular areas of uh, media production, uh, what advice you would give them? What little one sentence advice perhaps you'd give them? Let, let's start out. Well, first of all, we know a producer, uh, especially in uh, TV and the movies, is knowing someone to get you in, inside the door there and help you bring a little money to the table. But just if you wanted to be a writer, let's say you wanted to write scripts for a movie or TV and you got this great script. And I know there's some, been some local people here in the Twin Cities Unknown who's actually gotten their movies made. I, when I think about is it the Clint Eastwood movie about uh, the car? Anyway, it was some kids that went to my son's high school that got that movie made. But if I got a person here, a people in our audience who uh, want to be a writer or a script writer, what would you advise them to do to break into that uh industry career. Well, career. it's interesting. So I have a friend. I, I got my MBA. At, you talk about Ivy Day. I got my MBA at Columbia back in the day. Uh, and I got a, an old, a classmate and his son is in the film school at Columbia. And during last year, during uh, the coronavirus, you know, it was $80,000 a year. So they took us, he took a semester off. I said, that's a good decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, uh, you know, uh, he goes, well, what do you recommend? So Art is his name. He, he introduced, I got a call with his son, Ethan. And, and I said, partner with, I mean, if you're going to write or direct, usually there's writers and directors, and then you got camera guys, the cinematographer. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a sound guy, someone who's going to make sure the audio is good. And mm -hmm. you get some people who are going to be in front of the camera and you go do something, go film something. So they can, you can get the experience. That's the best experience you can have. So if someone's a writer, I would find someone to, instead of doing a full blown film, though you can do that, uh, start off with what's called a short, which is, you know, basically in, uh, in less than 15 minutes, it's called a short mm -hmm. and find, you know, if you went to school or you find someone with a camera, a lot of people are doing it with their iPhone now and just get some friends and have them act it out and go into a field or a garage or wherever you're going to do, and then put it out there. And then there's a lot of submissions, which is, you know, some are free, some cost a couple of dollars for shorts. And so people can start seeing your work. And, uh, and that's how you can get noticed is, is the, the best way to do something. If, if you're a writer, find mm -hmm. someone that, uh, you know, I'm sure there's someone in your world, if you get as went to school, who's uh, a camera guy or a camera girl cinematographer and and then uh, a lot of times they'll they'll like they can act as the sound person and then get some friends to put in front of the camera and say hey do this do that and yeah. uh and put it together and so now you have experience and now you've done something right. and it may yeah. not be perfect it may not be a, it may not win an academy award but doing something is the best experience right, uh, right. and the other thing i would do is uh, always lunch up. It's a, it's something, and I'm, I don't know if you've heard that, but lunching up is the best thing to do. Where you go find someone who's more successful than you and buy them lunch. Right. And hear their story and get their advice. Everyone loves to eat. Everyone likes to eat. Everyone, you know, loves a free lunch, so to speak, when mm -hmm. no free lunch. But find someone in your industry that, uh, that's, that's doing what you want to do. Right. Connect with them and offer to buy them lunch or a cup of coffee and hear what they have to say on what they did. And uh, that's that's I learned that years and years ago, lunching up, uh, right. find people that are doing what you want to do and, mm -hmm. uh, and and network with them. And so I think that's that's probably one of the most beneficial things. Someone and I can't remember. I, got, I think a guy named Bob Sabarian who helped me in my Wall Street career. He shared that with me he called lunching up. And at the time I went, what the heck is lunching up? And he goes, go buy someone who's more successful than you lunch and right, hear right. how they became more successful in your industry. 
you know, if you're a basketball player, don't, don't talk to a tennis player. There's two different skill sets and two different vibes, mm -hmm. but go talk to someone in your industry. Okay. So besides the original introduction into the field from your cousin, when you look back over your production career, who was that one person that you consider most influential in your success and why would you consider that person most influential? Well, it's, it's someone you know. You okay. met him. His oh, okay. name is Jeff Nallion. Okay. Jeff was here locally when you came to film? No, he was our director when we filmed you. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Okay, okay, right, right. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. We flew him in to direct right, right, you on right, your right, 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 uh right. -huh. And so he, he, Jeff produced the first Leprechaun movie and gave Jennifer Aniston her first start, her first starring oh. role. Okay. And so he's got 35 years of experience in this business, and we just uh, we just became really good friends. You know, we uh, and so we were, you know, uh, he's been a good mentor, and uh, and it's a good working relationship now. But he, he's someone that I met, you know, when he was getting ready to produce a Steven Spielberg sequel, and we helped with that, and we kind of became really, like I said, became really good friends, and then started working on a series of projects together. He's a good writer and director, so he has a different skill set than I do. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other thing, you know, because uh, if someone does exactly what I do, I don't need them. You know, right, I got to have right. someone who can do, who can compliment me. Right. And so uh, he, he's someone that we compliment each other. I have a certain skill set. He has a certain skill set. And so uh, it wor we work really well together. And, uh, and obviously I've done some things, you know, that, uh, you know, outside of working with him, but he, he helped guide me through this as well. Another guy, Larry Jacobson from Grasso Jacobson. And uh, he, he worked with Sonny Grasso, who uh, they made the French Connection movie about. And so they partnered, they have the second most hours on TV. And, and so he was a good friend. And uh, we're actually working on a couple of projects together right now as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, those are some folks who helped over the years. And, uh, but then, you know, you know, I, I try not to lean too much on people. I want to, uh, I've always been a go-getter. Like I said, I'm up early. I go to bed late. And, uh, but it's about building relationships. You got to build relationships at the studios, at the networks, the different production companies that you use. So you can, uh, you know, you try to, you, you try to build that, that network up. Um, but yeah, there's uh, within when <clears throat> when you're doing a film, it's a bigger project, so you gotta there's a lot more people involved. You got like 50 or 75 people, and you gotta have what's called department heads. So you have your hair and makeup department head, you have your set coordinator, you have your uh, costume or wardrobe, you know. So you got your sound department. So you got all these different departments: location managers, transportation, craft services. You gotta feed everybody. So you gotta you know. One person can't handle all of that on a big right. project. So you need to hire, you need to, you know, like a good, good contractor, you get your subcontractors and they handle it and you outsource it. And then, but they all report to you. So I don't have to report. I don't have a hundred people reporting to me. I've got seven to 10 department heads. They report to me. And so, and then it flows downhill from there. Sounds good. And I'm not going to bore you and the our audience with going through all the different uh, positions on a TV production or movie production, but there is one that I've always been curious about, Frank, and I guess this is my chance to get some uh, enlightenment on it. Casting directors. I'm like, how in the heck you become a casting director? And can anybody do it? <laughs> Tell me about casting directors, yeah, well, Frank. That's just a that's a personal thing with me. I asked my audience to excuse me on that one, but I was always curious about casting directors. Yeah. So obviously if you're a big name star, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Tom Hanks, you know, if so, someone, most people just will write a film, you know, that they know and then, you know, they don't, they don't have to audition <laughs> for mm -hmm. any, any roles. Mm -hmm. uh, casting director will typically cast everybody else in the roles. So uh, the director or producer will have what's called a, um, a character breakdown. Who are all the characters that are in this show or film? And then what are their ages? What are their sizes? You know, male, female, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. What are, what are the ethnicities? And then what happens is this casting agent will take all of that and they have a list of everybody 
on their, you know, headshots and resumes, and they will seek out people to match that. And then uh, the directors will audition them for a role uh, and say, okay, you know, they may have the lead there or they may do, hey, send me a, a video audition. You know, I'm going to give you a couple of lines and then just read it into, a car- into the camera as on, in character. Mm-hmm. And one of the best examples, there was an old TV show and now I forgot the name of it, but the guy's name was uh, Michael Chiklis. And he was in um, uh, the commish years ago. He was mm-hmm. kind of a pudgy guy. Uh, and he was, there was a, a, a role in a police show on FX and now I'm, 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 I'm brain freezing. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, I will try to find out the name of that. But it was a cop show, and he and he was auditioning for the lead role, which was a tough cop. So he lost some weight, went into the gym, and he went into went in there. He had a leather jacket on and jeans, and he went in in character, and he nailed it, and he became the lead, and it was a very very successful show. And so uh, that happens, uh, you know. You want and but other times, if hey, I need a six foot guy, brown hair, brown eyes you know, Italian, Italian from New York, and all of a sudden 50 guys who are six foot brown hair, brown eyes that are showing up for the audition and you all look alike because that's the, that's, you know, the role within the age range. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you have relationships with the casting agents and the casting directors, uh, this, you know, when a role comes up, instead of putting it out to the universe, maybe they say, Hey, I got a guy who's going to be perfect for that. And so uh, it all goes back to the relationship side. So you try to reach out to as many casting directors and casting agents as you can and, and say, hey, here's my here's a reel. Here's a, a video of some of the work I've done. And here's my headshots and my height and my weight and the age ranges I can play. And, and, uh, and you network and you take them out to lunch and you buy them flowers or send them a bottle of wine. And, hey, keep me posted. Hey, I didn't win. I didn't get this role, but keep me up to the speed on the next role. Or is there another role in this film that maybe I can play a smaller role just to develop a relationship? And so that's that's how the, what the casting directors or casting agents do. OK, so briefly here, Frank, tell me if I wanted to move to Hollywood and open up an office and say, Hey, casting director uh, across the uh, window or the door or whatever, who would I have to network with and how hard it would be for me to find these people to network with them or take them out to lunch? Oh, it's a, uh, well, you start with the, with the agents of the talent. Okay. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So Leonardo DiCaprio has an agent and right. there's, thousands and thousands of actors and un- unemployed actors, but you start with the agents of the, of the actors and you start with the smaller ones. And, uh, and the other thing is that you'd want to partner with other, with directors who are, who's directing a film because they're going to need to cast and who are the producers. So you build the casting when you build as a casting director, you'd want to partner with directors and producers on what projects they have coming up and say, hey, I can help cast that. And then maybe you partner with some other casting agents uh, and you co and you do it together as a partnership and build your build your business that way. Okay, so we're going to segue into you had mentioned earlier that you do campaign commercials. And I think from knowing you, most of the candidate that you do the commercial, maybe the only ones that you do commercial with are, are more on the conservative side. Is Am I correct in that, Frank? Yes. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with the divide, you know, you know, Republicans or Democrats. I just happen to be a Republican. Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pro-life guy and I work my butt off for my money. I'm a low tax guy. And so mm-hmm. those are core issues, you know. Right, right, and, right. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, but yeah, we, we take our storytelling skills as film and TV producers to political candidates around the country and help craft really cool, compelling commercials from a different perspective as opposed to traditional campaign commercials that are being spewed out there, which I don't think are, are very good. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're helping uh, the, here in Arizona, uh, former TV personality, Carrie Lake, she's running for governor for next year. Uh, you know, there's some folks out in North Carolina and in Georgia uh, that we're working with. And so, yeah, so uh, and it, obviously we try to figure out what's important to them and use their 
personality to make sure it comes through. So we're not, you know, uh, you know, we're not drawing a script for Morgan Freeman and we're bringing in Leo DiCaprio. There's two different styles and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and two different personalities and two different mindsets. So we just want, we try to get to know who the candidates are, you know, what's important to them and then f- figure out the demographics of the, of the district or the state or the local, uh, whatever the local race might be. Uh, what are the important issues that we're trying to get across to them? And the first commercial we always try to do is, is kind of like a pilot. You know, your TV pilot, you're introducing the characters to the world. And then each, uh, each, each uh, episode after that kind of reinforces with the pilot so that the world falls in love with the characters. And so that's kind of what we want to try to do with the candidates. So the first one's a pilot. We're introducing them, whether they're known or they're not known. And then each subsequent, uh, you know, uh, commercial kind of reinforces who they are to get out to the public on, on why, they, why they should vote for this particular candidate. And uh, just like in anything else, kind of like, you know, uh, you want to give them more reasons to say yes than to say no. And that's so a- that's really the goal on what we try to do. Okay. You mentioned Morgan Freeman. Uh, He's down in my hometown of Natchez, Mississippi. I hear filming a TV series uh, right now this year, as I understand. And my little hometown, you being the producer that you are, you should have heard of it, Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, I think James Brown's uh, movie was filmed there. Ali's movie. Uh, part of Mississippi burning, I think, but it's quite a few movies and TV series have been filmed there. Maybe one of these days we'll get you down there to film, film the story of my life, uh, right? There you and, go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned Morgan Freeman, and uh, what a lot of people don't realize, he's pretty conservative. Denzel Washington, they are conservatives out in Hollywood. In fact, I'm kind of yeah. surprised that uh, they get the exposure they do. And this is where I'm going, Frank. Uh, conservatives generally aren't welcome with open arms in the entertainment field, TVs and movies. Have you experienced any, uh, shall I say, business fallouts from being a conservative in the entertainment industry? Yeah, I can only count on one specific, and I'll tell it in a second, but it's guys like me, um, I get to do what I want because I'm the producer and the creator. Right. And, the, you know, as long as my shows are cool, fun, unique and cost effective, the networks are going to air them and and I'm going to get my films distributed, which is un- what is unfortunate is some of the people. So there's something called above the line and below the line. Mm-hmm. Above the line is talent like a Morgan Fre- Freeman, Leo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, the directors like Spielberg and Martin Scorsese, the producers those are people, those are the, what's called above the line. The below the line is where the production happens. Your camera guys, your sound guys, your key grips, your makeup, your craft services, you know, your, any of your wires, your, your lighting, everything for below the line. And I've had a couple of folks that we use on a pretty regular basis here in Arizona that, uh, that are no longer working on some other projects because of their political beliefs, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and I, I, you know, but I work with Democrats. I, I have some, some of my dearest friends are, are liberal Democrats. They know I'm conservative Republican, but we do good business. We want to, we want to make compelling shows or films and, and, uh, and, and get our stories told regardless of our political affiliation. One was, I mean, she, her, she was, a, she's still a sweetheart. We have dinner. We can, I mean, we're so like-minded, but we're politically opposite. And she wanted Trump impeached as soon as he, before he won, after he won. And it was just online, social media, she was going crazy. And, and I, you know, I just, and we would, I'd come, I'd go to LA and we'd have a steak dinner at Mastro's and, and we'd laugh and talk. And, but she was just so passionate about that. But the fact that some of these people who don't make a ton of money, you know, they're not multimillionaires, they run the cameras, they run the sound and the cords and, they put makeup on your face. And, um, and so those people are getting harmed and, or they got to be quiet. They can't say anything, right. which is, again, yeah. it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, and it reminded me back in the fifties that, you know, where, uh, you know, you know, communism and, and if you, you were Jewish, you get blackballed right. 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 and, right. you know, people lost their ability to work. Um, and there, it, it seems like that all over again. So I know, yeah. I know a lot of people keeping their mouths shut. Yeah. Uh, they're not saying anything because they need a job. 
Yeah. You know, this is what they do for a living. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that's, that's unfortunate. So, I, so my story was we were doing a pilot for Netflix a bunch of years ago, right around the 2015 and 16, when uh, the former president was vocal. <laughs> we'll use that word. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I hired a writer and, you know, I knew she was a Democrat. She knew I was a Republican, but we had more in common than we disagreed with. We loved baseball. We were both from back east and we're both in the entertainment. It was just it was more. We, like I said, we had more in common than we disagree with. But we agreed to move forward. And and we met her in L.A. And, you know, uh, with my cousin, my cousin joined us and she said, yep, we'll go ahead and do it. Well, lo and behold, uh, uh, I. I I got invited to the former president's one of his events and um, I was thought I was right behind him, but apparently the way the angles were, <laughs> it looked like I was his bodyguard uh -huh. and a hundred million people around the world are seeing me on TV on Fox at CNN, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, Sky News, you name it. I'm all, I'm literally, I, I, it was, I was on the front page of the New York times. I was literally and I am not a front of the camera guy. I like to be behind the camera. Well, this one person must have seen me. And so she didn't call me. She didn't email. She didn't text me. She sends me an email and saying, uh, Frank, I'm sorry. I, you know, I can't be involved with this project. I can't do business with anyone who stands next to Hitler. And uh, we lost her. And I, I took a couple of days because I was hurt. I mean, because she knew I was a Republican. I knew she was a Democrat. Right. And uh, but she didn't have the courtesy to call me. And that was the only time, yeah. you know, I'm 54 years old. I never lost a business deal, a relationship, uh, anything, because I'm a white heterosexual male who's right. a Republican. Right, right, right. And uh, that, that was the first time. So uh, and only time yeah. I haven't lost anything. I actually got some business with some night with some really good, amazing people that they happen to be Democrats, but I don't care. You know, right, but they, right, you know, right. we just did business together because it was good business. Right. Well, a couple of things. Uh, you know, once again, Frank, I tell people when you get to be my age, you lived a lot of the history that <laughs> people read about or don't read about. And I was just seeing, watching a documentary, uh, once again, a little clip on McCarthyism, uh, Senator McCarthy and his whole communist search and everything. And a lot of what's happening to not, not today reminds me of that whole thing where you're really judging people based upon their beliefs and ideas. And I just want to say to my audience, uh, one of the great things I think about this country is that we should welcome all ideas and, and give them the light of day. And let's just have a battle of ideas in the marketplace. Uh, I think that, uh, and it's really disturbing, uh, some of the uh, censoring that's going on with big tech, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, it's just, it's just crazy, really. And a lot of it is with the new generation of people who've been indoctrinated in our public school system to think that way. And it, it's looked like we are at times really losing our country, uh, Frank, uh, with the modern day. And they're doing it with us. And what's scary about it, just like McCarthy, Senator McCarthy, there's a certain self-righteousness about it that's just yeah. really scary. And, and it's really uh, going against all our American principles. But uh, that's another show. Uh, say, uh, before you go, Frank, uh, I really admire the tenacity and opportunities that you've had in the movie industry. But tell the people out there, uh, because Hollywood and the entertainment field is very tough. I just remember the first time we went out there, it's just all the almost like homeless people whose dreams have been crushed and just remembering that and keep in mind too i should tell the audience my son is in the acting field too and you're right it's tough it is tough man it is yeah, and you, yeah. you know everyone says la you know it's it's we're in a different world now with technology look at yeah, us that's, that's i don't have to point. be in minnesota yeah that's a good point uh-huh you don't have to be in scottsdale and yet look at us we're we're now putting together a pretty cool hopefully entertaining and we're getting some feedback on on different things maybe some people are turning off but but that's okay we'll get them back the, mm -hmm. you know, they always come back uh but, you know, so you don't necessarily have to live in it or go to L.A. anymore. You know, one, it's very expensive to do shows in L.A. You know, I've done mm -hmm. a handful. 
but you can feel you're, you're filming down in Mississippi and, mm -hmm. and they're filming in Alabama and they're filming in Georgia. So you don't necessarily have to be in LA to do anything. I mean, you can film and, and here's, you know, one of the things why we're, you know, we try to film in what's called tax friendly states. So this is a little bit about the business of, of film and TV. So say a movie costs a million dollars to make. I want to go to a state that's going to give me a tax rebate for spending my money in that mm -hmm. state. So Georgia is a pretty friendly state. Louisiana is another one, New Mexico. But I use Georgia because they, they'll give you 30% of the money you spend there. So I'll get $300,000 back. So that mitigates the risk for any investors that we have or the, they'll pick up any of the shortfall. So we can film anywhere, but we try to film in tax-friendly states because we always want to protect the investor's money because right, we want right. them to invest in future projects as well. So that's right. really important on the business side. So that's the business side of it. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, you don't necessarily have to go to L.A. to be successful in this because, you know, there, you can make a great TV show in Minnesota and you got all those lakes that you have there. And, oh, and yeah. there's, some pro there's some probably really cool shows that we can do there. And you can start off on local TV and then you work on maybe getting it picked up on a major broadcast. But uh, you, you can, you, you know, homes where the homes where the hearts at or hearts, where, you know, so that's something that you don't necessarily have to go to L.A. because it's tough out there. It's expensive mm -hmm. to live. That's why you got so many homeless people, you know, right. you, you know, five thousand dollars for a six hundred square foot studio apartment. Gosh, who can afford that? You know, property right. taxes, one hundred thousand a year. I mean, so you don't necessarily have to live there. Uh, you may want to live there after you're successful, but uh, you don't necessarily have to live there. You can travel back and forth there if need be to meet with some of the studios or networks and whatnot. But today, you don't even need to go there. You can do a Zoom call and, and have the conversation right. and, and do it that like, way. Like we're doing here tonight. So now, yeah. you help me understand why Tyler Perry's uh, studio is located in Georgia. Uh, yeah. But uh, thanks, Frank. We're about to at the end of our hour, it went very fast. Of course, you know, you're a good guy and we're friends, and I really love that. Uh, but we like to end our podcast every week on a positive message. And I got a lot of friends uh, in the acting field, been around them for a while, and I know some of them want to write and produce, but maybe leave uh, positive words of encouragement to anybody out there who's looking to get into the TV movie industry and being realistic, because I tell them it's, it's like trying to be an NBA player. There's a lot of heartbreaks and a lot of things that go along with that. So, But give them some encouragement, and uh, we'll end on that note, Frank, and we'll talk soon uh, next week. But give our audience, leave our audience with some words of wisdom and encouragement. Yeah, I think the, the best thing is what I said before. Find someone who's doing what you want to do and reach out to them. There's okay. nothing better. If you want to be a camera guy, and there's lots of camera guys out there in every state, and I would reach out to them, buy them lunch, offer coffee. How'd you do it? Um, and lunch up, lunch up, lunch up, lunch up. Talk to people in the industry that you want to go into. Okay. And, uh, that's, and, and be tenacious. Be yeah. fiercely tenacious in in your quest for whatever it is, uh, and so those are those are the words uh, that that I would encourage everyone to do. Uh, anyone wants to reach out to Lacey, reach out to me. I'm happy to kind of direct. Doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. We have relationships all over the country. Happy. I take every phone call. I answer every email. I answer. I'm all over social media. You can find me on social media. I'm happy to help everyone because people helped me. Right, and right. so uh, that's the nature of this business, and and I've been fortunate, and uh, but yeah, that's that. Those would be my encouraging words. Find something that you're passionate about, and 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 attack it like it's you know, like there's no tomorrow, and uh, get up every day like it's your last breath, and that's what you're going to go work towards, uh, okay. and that's what I tell my kids. I said work every day like you're you're taking your last breath, and work towards whatever it is that you want to do, and. Uh, and those are my words for you. Well, Frank, it's been a blessing having you on. Uh, to the audience, Frank, Frank Tuchia, uh Torch Entertainment, uh, TV movie producer, 
I uh, really thank you, Frank. And I look forward to having that steak dinner with you, too, either in Arizona or here in Minnesota or somewhere wherever we're going to get together. And I will get you down to my hometown to film something, even if it's just a little five minutes hello from me. So thanks once again, Frank, to cheer uh, to our audience out there. You want to support our broadcast, go out to LaceyJohnson.com. And next week we'll bring you another great guest. And maybe not as good as Frank, but uh, we'll, we'll try all right, Frank, thanks a lot. Uh, have a good time out there. Say hello to the daughter and the grandchild, and I'll do the same thing back here. You got it.